after 12 or 14 years of skirting around academia, as I say, with, around historians, uh, end up with the question which we've been asked to start with, how do we think about history? If you go to Kyoto, Japan, and you walk around the extensive a craft museum there. You see some wonderful Japanese crafts, a wide variety of them. Uh, printing, lacquer crafts, metal crafts, pottery crafts, silk crafts, a wide variety of them. And a very high degree of skill and artistry. If you go to Mumbai, Bombay, and you look around the archaeological museum there, which is in three circular stories. You start at the top and you work your way round and round, down to the bottom, taking three quarters of an hour and an hour. You, you see a, a similar, uh, a lot of uh, Indian artifacts, uh, starting with Stone Age, late Neolithic and ending up with um, uh, introductions from fashion cultures. And innovation in artistry. You see different forms, different colors, different shapes. But in functional innovation, it fades out to nothing. Fred Mark isn't here today, but this is, these are examples of his uh, high-level equilibrium traps. So what happened? But I suspect that a very slight rate of growth is important in a lot of the past high activities like this build up to industrialization. And this one, for instance, this increase in yield, doubling of yield 1350 to 1650 yields in England and Holland in wheat, I suspect, were extremely important in These are all, all represent changes in the properties of artifacts, except the number of elements one, which isn't a function at all to be thrown in to, uh, to show how to understand. But all of these represent artifacts that have embodied knowledge. It is the change of knowledge over this period that underlies this. The artifacts are merely the embodiment, the, the outcome of the change. We produce the animals that we see around us, which would have been a fairly popular sort of thing to do uh, around the 1800s. And people would produce represent their idea of how the world had watered itself, or how God watered the world. And it would, of course, have been a lot of nonsense. A lot of nonsense. Yes, they would have taken it perfectly seriously at the time. For each of us developed over the years a sort of view of how we think about history. And that becomes the sort of the base view in which we look at historical events. Uh, this is a base for me. It's, um, it's looking at the change of function of artifacts. It's an archaeologist view. If you dig down through the earth and you 
lift the artifacts and negate the artifacts, uh, you will there's a slice <coughs> through history of Chinese. Uh, it hasn't got bubbles in because it's Chinese. <laughs> uh, things roughly like this were known in Roman times, as Seneca clearly mentioned. Uh, in particular, their optical equivalent, that is, a glass tube that had been heated at the end and blown into a more or less spherical shape and filled with a liquid like water, optically behaves very like that and it's much easier to make. You don't have to know how to generate a sphere of self-generating, you don't have to polish it yourself polishing, <coughs> and you end up with something like that. If you take a little one and a big one, and you look, and I'll pass these around and you can do this, you see a tantalizing image. I've got a tantalizing image. <laughs> Alan at the moment. <laughs> Funny, I've got a tantalizing image of you. Don't you? <laughs> it's a tantalizing image, it's magnified, it's got a lot of aberrations on it, it's very cool and chromatic. It's upside down, but it's there. There's something going on that is very interesting there. Something that would fascinate minds like Roger Bacon's Christmas. Seneca and caused them to say in their, after a couple of drinks, I can see near and I can see far. I can see near perfectly well because if I do this with it, I've got a very good magnifying glass. Again, a lot of aberrations, but I can see things that I, uh, I can see a great big Peter Vries here. <laughs> a thing like that which is not a practical device so historians of the telescope will say that's not a telescope well it's not a telescope but it has the capacity to alter attitudes to what one might do with a bit of glass enormously in a tantalizing way and that can hang in the air for 300 years before somebody makes a practical telescope. And it leads to all the sort of half magic, half uh, hopeful comments in the literature about seeing near and seeing far. But you can't improve on it until you get the next stage into, I've got to go into the rag again. Uh, but I'm going to pass these round and you do it. And you'll see that you have magnification, you've seen near and far, and you can do it with two glass blown bowls filled with water. Mm. The big step forward from this of the seven, early 17th century was this, to make the simple lens. Uh, this had a market, uh, had a market, this was the market. As literacy grew and people as today grew older, and could more, with a read with more and more difficulty going out now like this. Uh, this changed the lives of clerics, as well as of people who wished to read. It gave them an extra 20, 30, years of, of reading. So it's going from that to that which is an artifactual leap. But that produced the conceptual leap, which is the, uh, the possibility of um, doing something interesting with glass. Uh, 
the, the second comment I would make after this artifact see, is that you know, I've been associated with academics now for some 13, 14 years, <laughs> <laughs> industrialist, and I've noticed a very clever way that they have of you know, discussion of this sort. Uh, if asked a question, they don't respond to the question, they turn it into another question. <laughs> and it's a very good technique. The question that arises from all our discussions, in my opinion, is uh, whether we're talking about new knowledge or new artifact. What is the mechanism of innovation? We're talking all the time about uh, innovation. We're talking about changes of what we know or changes of how we assemble atoms into artifacts from one level of functionality to another level of functionality. And the big question is, what is the mechanism of innovation? How do we do it? Uh, it's something that goes on in individual minds, but it always goes on within a social context. And uh, uh, to me, this is, this is the big question. This is the question behind these curves. These curves are all right, they're interesting, but um, uh, we are talking about uh, aggregates of innovation. But what is the mechanism of innovation? The, I detect from comments that have been uh, uh, made in the last few sessions that uh, uh, some people look upon it as an, uh, predominantly an intentional activity. Uh, there is another view, which I hold to, uh, that it is largely, or almost entirely, 99 point something plus, uh, an activity in which variation is produced, from which we make selections according to our desires of the day. And it is a selectionist mm -hmm. activity. Uh, even talking about history, like curves like that, uh, as human beings we have a strong tendency to pick out winners. Uh, while uh, things that happened to fit our perception of what was, what was good, what was a desirable outcome. This it tends to ignore uh, entirely make invisible to us the hundreds of thousands of activities, both ex uh, experimental or artifactual creation, of the things that are not winners uh, in any line of development for any one positive, say, functional improvement to show up there, uh, there will be a hundred activities that we do not pick out as being uh, advances in knowledge or in artifact. Uh, it, it, there's a series of programs on the television on the early uh, uh, caveman. Mm -hmm. uh, and it starts off with the observation that the Homo sapiens is the one survivor from at least a dozen, and probably an awful lot more, other species. But all our artifact development is of that nature. I think all our knowledge development is of that nature. And so, 
if we're looking at long lines of change, that's a sort of an aggregation of, development, of uh, improvements, uh, we're really looking at the outcome of a far greater amount of human activity. Uh, so we can always pick lines of development or activity that are off graph, off center. And we can point out those as developments um, in, in agriculture, in weaving. For instance, I've got weaving picks per minute here. I'm sure, having looked at drawings of, of uh, Chinese weaving machines, silk weaving machines, uh, that they had a higher rate of picks per minute than I have shown here in Western practice. I'm sure of it. They are producing extremely sophisticated assemblies of machinery. Uh, they probably didn't get beyond the, uh, the flying shuttle, but you've doubled your productivity with that. So all this type of work here has to be considered as a very loose representation of what happened over this historical period and can well ignore um, a, 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 a things that have gone in the rest of the world. But ignore them but without uh, honouring them. For instance, these wheats yields here are pretty much matched by rice yields that have been obtained purely by craft skills. These wheat yields require massive inputs of nitrogen. Nitrogen that became uh, a, a, an outcome of great developments in chemistry in the 19th century. And whatever you do with your hybridizations, with dry weeds, you have to put, be able to put more and more nitrogen in through the roots in order to get your weight of wheat up. In China, without the use of uh, Back, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, but with the use of blue green algae in the flooding waters, they got very considerable nitrogen production available to the roots of the rice plant. And they're getting high yield, they get very high yields uh, without the scientific revolution. So Anyway, my, my plea here is to turn the one question into another question and say, uh, what is the mechanism of innovation? This is where our thoughts and our studies should be focused. Not from the last batch. You could always see this because if you had a piece to screw onto another piece, and you used, say, half a dozen screws to do it, then the top piece would only fit onto a particular bottom piece. You put it onto another bottom piece and the screw holes don't line up. Uh, it didn't matter at all because the job of the fitter was not to make one that would fit a hundred other parts, it was to make one that fitted one other part. As soon as one had to fit a hundred other parts, and this occurred, the, the classical case is uh, Colt with his firearms in the States, but it was done far earlier in Italy, for instance, where you'd have two million silk winding bobbins a year made of a standardized form. 
that would have to fit any of the silk twisting spinning machinery in the, uh, in the city. Um, there, if, if something isn't sufficiently standardized, it doesn't work. Just like Watt's thing, if it isn't precise, uh, sufficiently precisely made, it doesn't work. And the endeavor of the exercise is well, it's wasted. So I think we're just looking at the co-evolution of the artifact and the means of communicating precisely the, the artifact, uh, the, that artifact, uh, bearing in mind the way in which it is manufactured. Uh, with what, with his steam engines, for instance, if there was, these were being made, made in Cornwall, uh, Murdoch would go down there, and he would engage fitters who would be expected to understand how to put together all the beam work. They wouldn't ex be expected to have any precise information. But when you get to the, the governor that determines the speed of the machine, this is precise and it would require what's precise drawings, the sort of thing that you see in the patent office. But there's not much point in China of doing precise drawings like that on a silk spinning machine that is made out of bamboo, literally bamboo and string, very cleverly made, very, a great ingenuity. But the precise, uh, to get the understanding of how it is made, that is necessary. That's what would the magistrate would take as his contribution to the next mm. plot he's got to be in charge of. Mm. He's got to take the understanding of how it's made. He doesn't have to take a working drawing. And that's what we're seeing in these Japanese Kunis's pictures. They're pictures that, that uh, communicate understanding of what is going on. The, the question of reliable knowledge and science, which I would like to just reflect on for a moment. Uh, that's a, an early artifact. It's 100,000 years old. <laughs> and for 100,000 years, it remained the tool with which mankind confronted nature. Uh, so this was the early stages of its development. That's supposed to be 2000. 2000 BC, so that's oh, yeah. <laughs> 96,000 years after this. <laughs> you know. um, this made out of flint. Uh, it's probably the first global economy because you find these all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, no monopoly to it. Found in Australia. Not 100,000 years ago, but say 30,000, 35,000 years ago, in North America, maybe 30,000 years ago, all over Europe, over Africa. So there's your first look at the economy. And uh, it's a highly innovated item, um, a, a great deal of skill and a great deal of um, learning from prior generations has gone into it, even the early ones. It's a thousand years ago. Yeah. And so there is something in it that one might call reliable knowledge. Uh, it's sustained the human race for a thousand years, so something that bears some degree of reliability to it. On the other hand, it is very uh, closely placed reliable knowledge. If you wrote down how to do it, or you go on, go out and on the earth and you pick up a bit of something and you hit it, you won't end up with this. It's very specific. You have to have a material which is, is normally flint, nearly always flint, 99.9 .9 times out of 100 is flint, 
first will produce a conchoidal fracture, leading to a sharpish edge. You have to know how to unsharpen that edge in secondary working. Uh, having got to that stage, uh, you have reliable knowledge so long as you can recognize the right bit of flint. But even then, it has to be the right bit of flint. Uh, the flint are obtained from flint mines. You don't go down onto the beach and pick up the, the, the lumps of flint which proliferate all over the place because it doesn't chip well. Uh, if you asked uh, uh, the Neolithic man, why doesn't it chip well? Well, if you could have, understand his language and communicate with if you ask a scientist nowadays, why doesn't it chip well? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's called progress. But <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't chip well. Uh, so you have to have this the specific, the, the, the right type of fruit, and then you're in business as a homo sapiens. Now, that, the, that type of knowledge generation produces uh, uh, knowledge that is reliable in constrained defined circumstances but it's not universal this lot happened as a result of knowledge being generated in an entirely different sort of human activity same mental processes but applied in a quite different way this is where the historians of science come into their own telling us what happened here, which was an essential, in my opinion, absolutely essential precursor to what happened here. Uh, uh, producing reliable knowledge, but of universal applicability. Uh, gravity uh, is uh, pretty much a universal, although astrophysicists would spend their days nowadays trying to show where there are bits of the universe where it isn't universal. To all intents and purposes from the Homo sapiens point of view, it is a universal. And most of the other forms of knowledge that have been acquired over that period and are incorporated in there are of a different degree universality, testability to the knowledge which is very usefully incorporated in there. But that's one the first point I would like to make. My mind goes back uh, to um, my very, very first contacts with academia, I think 15 years ago, and it was before guys at uh, All Souls College in Oxford. They were all historians. I know one was a historian of science, one was a demographer, one was a historian of English culture, and one French, I believe. And they were all very distinguished, and they told me that. <laughs> None of them said, I am very <laughs> But each of them is said, is it he is? Said, <laughs> and I was the industrialist there, and they kept the little pack slightly away in case they caught anything. Uh, and um, they said to me after a chat with a couple of And, and uh, what is your interest, Mr. Martin? So I got a bit of paper, a bit of A4, and I said, well, my interest is this. Uh, I think, I'm not a historian, but I think the societies seem to do something like that. See, my interest is to try and understand what happened here, you see. And I got from these historians um, the most appropriate, I think, response I've had. They burst into laughter. <laughs> <laughs> they all burst into laughter, which is not a bad response, really. Uh, and I've always remembered it. Uh, and the sort of musings about triangles and uh, 
the relationship between knowledge and artifact and artifact and manufacture, which was the area. Uh, in, uh, take, come out of that sort of thing. And I often think the most responsible for the primary response is to burst into laughter. The, if we take the triangle, we have knowledge, innovation of new artifacts, <coughs> knowledge starts to have an impact on our standard of living, and then the manufacture in quantity of those artifacts, which is where the possibilities of the innovated artifact are made available to large slices of the populace. Uh, and then we consider that triangle, if we consider it from a, a particular point of view and say, well, what doesn't it tell us? Uh, there's nothing in this, nothing in what we discussed the first day, that explains why it goes round. It requires members of our species at these corners to take action to generate new knowledge, to innovate new artifacts, to make new artifacts, to provide a new sort of base of society which may, if more people generate new knowledge, take the thing round. But there's nothing implicit in this. Uh, it is a requirement for the production of new resources in a manner that, particularly in a manner, uh, that acts in some ways as an explanation to, as an explanation to what goes on here, but it requires people to do things at each stage. There's no motivation in this in itself. Um, a number of people who have been involved with these projects over the years have confronted the question of motivation because it's obvious central to this activity it is motivation and the time to pursue it in each of these corners that gets those corners going and makes the thing work but uh, we have uh, had um, inputs from people who have studied motivation, we read most of the books on motivation. Uh, I personally feel I've learned very little about motivation and that the, uh, it, one uh, it gets much further in looking at um, paper plane, uh, why this goes up. Lack of motivation or a different sort of motivation would presumably help to explain why you get into declines here. But it is very difficult, I know of no way, in order to um, make any really objective statements about that sort of motivation. Uh, it's much more helpful to look at the circumstances which tend to hold things down, which is what Alan would be coming on to, I think. Um, the, the forces, the, the traps, the, the things that um, tend to hold societies into stasis, that tend to reduce rates of growth, so that you have maybe that rather than that. Uh, things that remove motivation. The other thing that the triangle doesn't start to approach is the manner of uh, 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 analyzing the enormous variety of ways of generating the new knowledge here. I've touched one on one here, that embodied, embodies knowledge. Uh, what was the mechanism by which that knowledge was obtained? What was the mechanism by which it was passed on through the generations? 
And that's one of the simplest artifacts that we yeah. have. Um, what was the mechanism? We know the, the uh, <coughs> events that led to the next age, the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. We know that in high probability people built fires next to cliffs that contained ores and got a new sort of substance out of it. Uh, but the mechanism to actually make, the, make this, the, to uh, generate the knowledge to do this, we don't know. And this is down right down at the easy end of Homo sapiens knowledge mechanism. Up at the other end, where we're getting into the mechanism of generation of knowledge here again, we can tell stories about what happened. Uh, what goes on in people's minds in order for that to happen, we've got practically no knowledge of. So there are no answers in this to the big questions of what sort of uh, uh, mechanisms do we have to produce that sort of knowledge or the knowledge that produces this camcorder. So it's instructive to consider what things like this triangle uh, do not show us. They show us the steps that have to be gone through in order to end up with a new resource. They don't show us how we go through those steps. And the existence of the triangle has no automatic mechanism in it whatsoever for the rotation of the Um, I would reflect for a moment on the disciplines who have been involved in discussion about the clustering of, particularly of uh, material culture over the years uh, in economic history, history of science, um, sociology, psychology. And the general approach has been to, I, I remember particularly years ago, the feeling that if progress was made in many little areas, then knowledge of what was happening in the world would fall out of this, out of an aggregation of essentially people doing their PhDs and then pursuing their careers, polishing their PhDs and that that process would give us an understanding of the total of how the world works. Uh, that seemed to be in vogue 15 years ago. Uh, there seems to be considerably more scepticism about it now. And I'm noticing a tendency in disciplines to get the uh, effect that um, I mentioned, the effect of diminishing returns that when a great deal of work has been done by clever people within a discipline, uh, and then the next generation picks it up, uh, rethinks it, saying, I oh, know that was the wrong way of looking at it, the old one, we should be thinking it this way. Um, then, in, uh, after a few decades in the discipline, people scratching their heads and thinking, well, where do we go from here? And I've noticed that in, uh, I think, each of the individual disciplines that uh, I have had some contact with over this 15-year period. And yet, uh, this question is a broad, silly question that produces the, um, the, the laughter of these first four historians, appropriately. Uh, the question of well, how does the world work? Um, what total set of conditions comes about in order to be able to explain that? And in some parts of the world, or over long periods of history, that um, remain uh, better understood questions, but no particular answers. 
And my own feeling is that um, the, uh, the next uh, phase of activity in the disciplines which have confronted this, particularly in history of science, uh, this in history of technology, here in history of manufacture, uh, that they are reaching laws, they are responding to law of diminishing returns. And uh, as somebody has already pointed out today that innovation seems to come in boundaries between activities. And my feeling is that uh, the next action will come in understanding the relationships between knowledge and innovation of artifacts. That's around this area. Or understanding the enormous feed-forward and feedback mechanisms between innovation and the marketplace here. And particularly, uh, the, uh, the way that material culture is uh, in both positive and negative feedback modes with the generation of new knowledge. Then we would start to understand what the forces are that go in this direction. That's it, really. Carry on with traps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.